Okay, hello everyone. Today I'm talking about Markstrat and introducing you to the game and what you need to know to make your first basic decisions for the practice round. So Markstrat's this uh, virtual simulation game where you're going to be managing some brands. You can expand the number of brands that you manage over time as you do research and development R&D projects and then basically build a brand uh, to launch a new R&D project. But starting out, you're taking over for an existing company, and that company already had two brands that were being sold. The two brands are being sold in what's called Sonite, which is going to be just the name of a product category, like an industry, and that industry is selling electronic consumer durable goods. So that's like a uh, computer, laptop, VCR, DVD, something that will last for a while and people make with the intentions of getting a lot of utility out of it, but maybe, at least for some consumers, there's some sense of identity or self-signaling or um, trying to feel like they are getting something that's like very high quality. So it's different consumers are going to be looking for different aspects of uh, the product and aspects of what a brand has to offer them. So there's going to be marketing research reports that you're going to read. There's going to be um, agencies that help you with advertising, so advertising agencies. There's also market research agencies, and you will employ both with directives in terms of information you want to get or in terms of campaigns you want to be built out. They're not very like well-developed, so it's not like you do an advertising campaign and they like show you a commercial that they created for you. It's just saying, like, here's the objective. We want to raise awareness among this consumer segment, and then they'll go ahead and try to raise awareness in that segment by creating some promotional material and getting it through the right channels of uh, promotion, be that like social media, TV, print, whatever it is that's relevant for that segment, that that segment pays attention to. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you to the MarkStrat world and then go ahead and show you some of the basic reports that can help you make the most kind of simple decisions related to pricing, how much to produce, um, which segments to prioritize, uh, distribution, which channels do you want to make sure that you're emphasizing with your resources so that is your sales force, your commercial team that goes out and meets with the retailers in the different channels and goes ahead and helps educate them about the features of your product and make sure your product's in stock and looks good and is displayed right and um, shown correctly on the retailer's website or whatever it is. So uh, it's a hypothetical world. It's built based on real data from these existing industries, these existing product categories. So these consumer durable tech goods, uh, consumer electronic goods. And um, it can be a lot of fun if you uh, are interested in brand management, strategic brand management. This is a good simulation of what it looks like from a very high level, taking in research reports, taking in data, making decisions, and then being held responsible for the performance of your brands and the impact of what your actions had on the outcome. Of course, that's going to be subject to the decisions of the other competitors in that product category. So you might make a great decision in like one world, assuming a competitor acts in a certain way, but if a competitor does something unexpected, that decision might end up not being so good. So uh, I'll just walk through different aspects of the user interface and show you some basics. Okay, so the first thing um, to note is this is the home screen. If you click on this box, it'll always take you to this home screen and it lays out a bunch of different tabs through which you can go in and get more information. It also, another way to access it is just through this kind of side drop down menu. So there's Prepare, this is the user handbook. What I like about it is you can hit control find and go and just find the specific information you need to access to understand a research report or to understand how to make like a pricing decision or how to design a new product or how to um, launch a product based on a design that has been implemented by your R&D team. Next is just company results. These are always available to you. This is internal information, so like your finances, how much did you produce, how much did you sell, did you complete any R&D projects, so any new tweaks to your engineering so that you can sell a 
new product with uh, enhanced battery life or enhanced screen. The product that you're selling in Sonite industry is like a laptop or a tablet. It's um, kind of like think of it like a tablet. This is other market that you can get into later. It's called the Bodite market, and that's basically like a virtual reality goggle. Uh, it's not, you don't have to think too much about like what was the laptop market like or what's the virtual reality market going to look like. It's more just like a merging of all these different data points from these existing um, product categories that have already come out in the past. But um, so for company results, you can also look back at past decisions of the management team that um, was running the company before you took over. Sometimes you can access feedback from your coach which says like, maybe you should raise your price, stuff like that. I have to decide if I'm going to make that accessible to you or not, and I'm not sure I'm going to, because then you just basically just do what it says, and it takes away some of the um, thinking. Okay, there's also some industry reports, so some information that is just available to everyone. It tells you things like the inflation rate, um, what the gross domestic product is like, so is the economy doing well? It is. That's a nice feature of this. Um, basic information. It's not so important to think through carefully. Um, one thing that I do like about it a lot is this market report. It goes through and looks at every single product that's currently for sale, and it tells you the product characteristics. So does it have a lot of battery? Does it have a lot of processing power? What's the design? So the, for all the different characteristics that describe your product, you can go in there and see what your product has and also what competitors have. It even has how much it costs to produce that product. Um, so that's really helpful, I think, especially when you get to the part of the game where you think about making tweaks to your product. So you go to your engineers, you do a research and development project, and you say, let's change it so our battery life is better because the consumer segment we're going to go after cares a lot about battery. Or let's decrease our battery because the consumer segment we're going after mostly uses their device in home, and so battery is not an important feature, and so they'd rather pay uh, a lower price and have less battery than pay a higher price and have battery, for instance. Okay, so next is the market research reports, and these are produced by an external marketing research agency. So you have to pay money out of your budget in order to get these different reports. There's industry benchmarking, which gives you detailed information about your competitors. Consumer survey and panel is good information about like what everybody's brand awareness is, what's the purchase intentions for each brand across each consumer segment, um, and what's the current market share for each brand across each consumer segment. So it's a survey that is done to a lot of consumers, and you get to see which brands each consumer uh, segment is aware of and which brands they're considering purchasing and which brands have they purchased. The distribution panel is focused on how much coverage my daughters are trying to distract me effectively, I might say. Can you guys go play out of my area? Thank you. Um, <laughs> so you have the distribution panel. Semantic scale is on a 1 to 7 scale. So semantics is like, you, know, you ever heard like, that's just semantics. It's like, that's just words. So low, high, how do people perceive your brand on all the key attributes? So are you seen as having a lot of power? A uh, seven would be you have a ton of power. A one on a scale of one to seven would be your brand is seen as having low power. Um, same thing with battery life, same thing with design. So on a survey, you can see how you're viewed, how you're perceived, and then you can go and look at your actual characteristics, and most likely they kind of line up. So like if you have more battery in your product, you're probably seen as having more battery by consumers. But there can be mismatches. That can be due to advertising. Um, that can be due to you've made an improvement in your product, but people aren't aware of that improvement yet because you haven't invested enough in advertising or you haven't invested enough in your distribution channels and having Salesforce, um, your commercial team members going out and meeting with retailers and educating them how, yeah, version 1.0 had a bad battery, but version 2.0 has an awesome battery. Um, Multi-dimensional scaling is similar to semantic scaling. It's just that it occurs at a more abstract level. So if you think about like big picture advertising of 
uh, BMW. You think BMW is performance. You think Volvo is safety. So it's not the attributes of the product itself. It's not like the braking or the zero to 60. It's like big picture. What's my first impression of the brand? And so what's nice about multidimensional scaling is it uses this technique that takes the individual attributes like, uh, you know, battery design, processing power, and it kind of merges them with different weightings to get to these more abstract, higher level uh, evaluations that consumers make of brands. And that's really interesting to track the positioning. So what does the consumer segment want and how are you positioned? What's your uh, perception between you versus your competitors? And you can go to your advertising agency and you can say, hey, I'm perceived as being having low performance or being not very economical and I want to change that. And I actually have the product characteristics that should justify me being seen as more powerful or being seen as having, uh, being more economical. And then you can go and put in the values that you want to be perceived as and your advertising agency will say, okay, we need to come up with some creative that's going to convince this consumer segment that this brand is actually a high performance brand or a good value brand, right? So it's big picture, abstract stuff, great for understanding the competitive dynamics, great to see what your fit is, right? In terms of your product and the segment. So the product and the target market, how well does that fit? What's the product market fit? If that's high, usually you gain market share, especially if it's a better fit than your most close competitor. Competitive intelligence gives you some information on where your competitors are spending their money. So are they focused on segment A or segment B? Are they putting more into advertising or R&D? Are they putting more into um, commercial team uh, or advertising? One nice thing about uh, the competitive intelligence is if you see a competitor has just spent a bunch of money on R&D, right? They've, hot, they've got a bunch of engineers working on making their product um, have different features, let's say better battery life then you know in the near future they're probably going to come out with an enhanced version of their brand that has higher battery life and you could potentially lose market share when, when that new version of the product is introduced. Experiments are market level experiments. So you think of two markets that are very similar. Let's say Eugene and Corvallis or Sacramento and uh, Salt Lake City I don't know, or like Fresno and Stockton. Just pick any two different markets that are somewhat unique. Portland and Seattle. And what happens is these kind of consumer uh, brands will sometimes do advertising, um, additional advertising or launch a new product first in one market and not another. They call that market testing. And they'll see what the lift is in sales. And so you can see like, oh, if I increase my advertising by 20% or if I hire a bunch more salespeople for the Seattle market, how much gain do I have in sales relative to Portland? And then you get a sense of the return on investment. So it's a good way of calibrating where you want to spend your money. You have a fixed budget. You have to allocate it across all these different points. And it's really tough. That's one of the places where one team can stand out versus the other because you both make good decisions, but one allocates their budget to the highest return on investment opportunity. And they're going to get market share. They're going to gain... Um, additional sales for their budget. Market forecast is really important for estimating demand and also picking a segment where you think that segment's attractive and that's going to be worth your while. So it looks at the various different consumer segments and it projects into the future how many units are they planning to purchase in the future. And if you know that information, you can know how much to produce. You can go tell your manufacturing logistics operations team like hey we need to hire enough people we need to have the warehouses we need to have the um, components manufactured and delivered enough that we can produce let's say 150,000 units of our laptop because that's how much we think we're going to be able to sell because we are going to capture 20 percent of a segment that's going to um oh shoot now i gotta do the math what's five times 150 uh is that 750,000? I don't know. Um, so you can basically project into the future what your expected demand is if you can project your own market share and you can use the market forecast to estimate 
the size of each segment and you know what segments you're going after you have some sense of the market share you can capture that helps you estimate demand that makes sure that you've manufactured and produced enough units such that you're not going to like do all this great advertising make create a bunch of demand for your product and people go to the stores and it's out of stock right that would kind of be disappointing Contrant analysis finally the last one i talked about it a little bit in the lecture that i posted today on customer centricity but conjoint it's like you've heard of conjoint twins or a joint like your elbow right, if you pull in one direction it's necessarily going to pull something in, in the other direction these decisions you make in terms of product design are not done in a vacuum if you survey customers and you say would you like you know, a car that's faster, has better gas mileage, brakes better, and has better design, they'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, also, would you like it at a low price? Sure, give me that car. But if you have to ask them, okay, what would you prioritize? Sometimes people are hard at saying, of those aspects, this is what's really going to matter to me when I make the decision. And so what Conjoint does is it has people evaluate these bundles of attributes. So it has them evaluate these prototypes of the actual car in the example I was giving before. And then if it gets people to evaluate different prototypes, it can back out to say how much they care about each individual aspect. So like what really matters to this segment is they really care about battery and they don't care so much about processing power. So they'll sacrifice less um, uh, processing power if it can give them more battery. And that's kind of what happened with the first mobile devices, right? So they weren't as powerful as like a laptop computer, but they had better battery life because they used less processing power and that allowed people to kind of go about into the world and be able to use it as a phone and computing on demand and other things. Another example is for the Peloton case we talked about, right? If you're Peloton and you're designing for the at-home use case, you can design your bike to be a little bit sleeker, a little bit more high design and not worry so much about durability. If you're selling to a gym, you need something that's very durable that can withstand high utilization and then you can sacrifice things like how good it looks because people aren't going to have it in their living room so some of these things are of natural trade-offs like processing power and battery or design like aesthetics versus durability and so sometimes you really want to know okay our consumers care about both things because they're good but what's really going to be most important well conjoint analysis helps you separate out the things that are really most important and other aspects of a product aren't really going to impact the utility of the consumer or their likelihood to make that purchase. And so you can kind of ignore those. You can cut out of there and you can save some money because like, let's not give a bunch of processing power if it's either going to hurt us for battery life or just add a lot of unnecessary cost. Okay. So those are the market research studies. You don't get them automatically. You only get them if you spend money on a marketing research agency that will, or, that will order them for you. Finally, after you've digested all that information, you want to go ahead and make decisions. So the easiest decision is you can give yourself a team name. It won't affect your sales, but um, it can be fun. So you can go ahead and if you want to waste time thinking of a funny name, have fun. Um, research and development, that's where you can go ahead and ask your engineers to create a, a new product for you or a new version of a product. So you say, hey, we used to have, we have these two products that each have, let's say, these characteristics, but we think the consumers are going to want something different. So can you go ahead and figure out how to make us a tablet that has better battery life? And then it costs some money and they'll figure it out. They'll do the math, they'll do the work. Um, they also got to work with the production so that they can figure out how to produce that product. You can actually keep your product exactly as it was before, but you can hire a bunch of engineers and say, hey, here's some money. Go figure out how we can produce this for less money per unit. So you pay money up front in terms of the expense, in terms of research and development, but then you're able to then produce a tablet that you can still sell for the same amount of money as before because it's got the same features and characteristics, but it costs you less to produce it. So you've expanded your margin on your product. Brand portfolio would be where you would go ahead and update your brands. So let's say you've done a research and development product and you've made it so that you have a version of your product you could sell that has better battery life. Then you go into your brand portfolio and you say, all right, let's go ahead and update our brand 
so that it has, we'll keep the same brand name. We got all that good brand equity, all that brand awareness, et cetera. But we're just going to change it so that next year we're going to produce our new and improved version. Um, if you want to do an R&D project to launch a brand new brand, so for instance, for the Vodite, that's the virtual reality market, you can go ahead and ask your engineers to create a virtual reality headset, and then you can go into your brand portfolio. And once that project's been completed, you can say, all right, let's launch a new brand in this new market. And if you're first to market and you price it enough and you have a good margin, you'll get some initial sales and, and that can be a great way to raise your stock price. Um, or you can sit back and wait for someone else to launch and then once they do, you can learn from what they did and you can come in with something that hopefully is even better. Your marketing mix is where you go ahead and you set your pricing. What are you going to uh, recommend retailers charge for your product? Um, you go ahead and tell them how much you think you need to produce. So if you've done the market research and you've estimated demand correctly for the segment you're going after and you know that you have this great advertising uh, campaign that's going to come out, you think you're going to gain market share and you multiply your expected market share, let's say 30% times how big the segment is. Let's say there's 100,000 units or let's say there's uh, 10 million units. All right, cool. 30% of 10 million, you're going to get 3 million units sold. So you go into your marketing mix and you say, we're going to produce 3 million units. Um, your commercial team is where you go ahead and you say, I have these salespeople all over the country. I want to have them focus on promoting um, brand B. And I'm really going to focus on the online retailers. Or I'm really going to focus on the mass merchandisers like the Walmarts, the Targets, you know, those big box stores. Um, or you could do specialty stores. So, you know, the people who really know products well, small shops dedicated to consumer electronics. Those are the three channels you can focus on. And you can pick which brand you want to um, go for. And it's kind of fun. You can hire people. You can fire people, too. It feels bad in this current uh, economic environment to fire anyone. But if, if that's who you are, you can do that. You go ahead and you order market research studies from your um, marketing research agency. The marketing plan makes you just go through the process of checking and making sure everything looks good. So you can go in and enter like, I, I want, I think I'm going to get 30% of that segment. I think the segment's going to buy this many units. It goes ahead and multiplies those together and says, okay, this is how much you need to produce. Or it looks at your production plan and sees if it matches your expected sales and it calculates your profit and loss, so your P&L statement for each one. Your decision review will just make, uh, give you a chance to make sure you didn't make any mistakes. Um, okay, what else did I miss? I think I missed advertising. Advertising is under the marketing mix. So you can go ahead and say, we're going to go after this consumer segment. We're going to spend this much money on getting our message out there. We're going to spend this much money on making sure our message is high quality. So you can spend money on uh, media. So that's like, let's say you want to focus on um, getting your message out there. So you do a big media buy. That means you're going to be on TV, you're going to be on social media, you're going to be on print, you're going to be everywhere your consumer consumes information. Um, now, advertising research basically gives your agency, your advertising agency, enough money to invest in making sure that your ad is high quality, that it achieves the objectives you set out for it. So typically that's around five to 10% of your total media spend. So let's say I'm gonna spend a million dollars on having my ads get out there. So I'm gonna buy advertising from CBS, from um, YouTube, from Facebook, right? That's getting the access, uh, the right to basically have your ad be seen. And then the advertising research is making sure that the quality of the ad is high. So the ad will be effective. So that's typically around 5 to 10%. Usually you spend more on advertising research if you're trying to do something new. Like I'm trying to uh, educate everyone how my product has actually got a lot better battery than I'm currently perceived. Um, or I have a brand new brand that I'm launching. So I really need my ad to really cut through the noise and be innovative and cool. Okay, so lots of decisions that you want to make that are all going to be informed by all these kind of research reports. Um, so this tile view of the homepage lays it all out. You kind of work from top to bottom and left to right. It's kind of the typical way to work through all these decisions. Um, you're going to have practice, so you can kind of have fun, explore. Um, 
get to know all these different tabs. One thing you want to check every time when you open it is your budget, okay? This has your budget, this has your errors and, warning, and warnings. Um, if one of your teammates has logged in and opened up a page but never logged out, never clicked out of it, it seems like they're making a decision, it won't let you go in and make the decision. This is a place you can kick them out, so you can go ahead and take control of the steering wheel, um, if you will. Okay, <coughs> so um, what should you do? You can start with the company dashboard to work your way down. This budget shows your deviation. So what's your total budget? It takes out what you've spent and this is any leftover money. So currently if I click on it, I can see that I have an authorized budget of um, 7,100. Okay, good. These numbers are in thousands of dollars. I'm like, well, that's a small budget. How am I going to get paid? Um, so the real budget is $7.1 million. Okay. I didn't borrow any capital. I'll give you a loan if you're doing R&D for the headset for Vodite. you got to email me, message me in advance. But you can get loans if you're doing a big, expensive art research and development R&D project to try to launch a virtual reality headset. Um, then you have your available budget. It takes out your advertising expenditures. It takes out your commercial expenditures. Those are all the salespeople that you have that are going out and meeting with your different distributors and your different channels. It takes out the money that's going to your marketing research agency for your marketing research studies. It has your total expenditures, and then you have any leftover money here. You can cut money from here if you feel like you've over allocated, but it usually starts out with whatever you spent the year before, and then you can increase spending, you can decrease spending, whatever you want. Currently, all the money is being spent on Sonites. That's that uh, tablet, um, laptop, uh, product category, and you're not spending any money currently on Vodites, which is the virtual reality headset market. This company has two brands, Soft and Solo. It looks like they're spending about $2 million each on advertising and about $624,000 each on commercial team. Now, what are the odds that this is the correct allocation of your budget? You know, highly unlikely that each brand deserves an equal amount of money and that the split between advertising and Salesforce should be equal across both brands. So one of the things you're going to try to do is right size that. So let's say if 90% of my sales are coming from my brand soft and only 10% of my sales are coming from my brand solo, well, unless I have projections that solo is going to take off, I probably should have my budget kind of fit better to, um, where my sales are coming from, at least historically. That's one piece of information you could take to adjust your budget. I talked earlier about those experiments where you compare, like, if you increase your advertising and increase your sales force in one market but not another, right? You can do these small test market experiments, and if there's a, you know, big or small lift in sales, you can say, okay, I could pour more money into, let's say, advertising for my brand soft um, versus... Maybe I don't want to spend so much on um, solo because the experiment says that any increase in spending doesn't result in enough increase in sales to justify that level of spending. Okay, so um, if I look at my uh, company dashboard, it shows my stock price. Every year, you're going to make a decision, a set of decisions, and then the simulation will run, and you'll open up it again, and you'll see if your stock price went up or not. If it goes up, you're going to get points on your grade for your short-term performance. If it goes down, uh, sorry, better luck next time. Um, you get more points for your long-term performance, but there is some short-term pressure when you run a public, uh, publicly traded company. So that's meant to reflect that. You get to see your revenue, your earnings before taxes, your market share in terms of units. So of all the units of laptops that are sold, how many did your company sell? Um, and market share in terms of dollars. Of all the revenue that was generated in that industry for that year, how much did you get? So in this case, this company um, got uh, about 20%, 19, it says 19% of the revenue uh, in terms of market share, but it sold 28% of the units. So that means we're probably selling a lot of, uh, we're like a high volume, low cost brand. Um, according to this information, I'm basically selling um, 
I'm getting more of my revenue from solo. So about 18 million from solo versus only 17 million from soft. But I'm selling, um, I'm making more money. This is contribution, which means profit. So even though I have more revenue from solo, I'm making more money from soft. I'm only getting 7 million from solo. So you could think of that as like the profit margin. Um, so for any dollar kind of brought in from a sale of solo, less of that is hitting my bottom line. Because I know the expenditures on advertising and Salesforce were equal, it must mean that um, my profit margin is worse for um, solo than it is for soft. Okay, so that's just your very first company dashboard already a lot of information so you can see how it's going to take you some time to get used to this game um, financial report can kind of give you some information of sales and expenditures per brand production report will so will tell you if you produce too many or too little of either of your brands uh, r&d report will show you the product characteristics that have been developed by your engineers that are underlying the brands that you're currently selling if you've done a new R&D project, you can see it there. Past decisions shows you all the details, like what research studies did you order, which segments did you target, etc., etc. Um, I like the market report and the production report as good places to get some quick information beyond just the financials. So the market report is particularly helpful because for each brand that's currently being sold, in this case, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right. Two are being sold by Team M, which has two brands that start with M, uh, Most and Move. And again, two are being sold by Team R, Rock and Roll. I'm selling Soft and Solo. I'm managing those brands. And there's a Team T that's managing Tone and Tops. Okay, They were all launched in period zero before we took over. I can see the actual characteristics of the product. And I can see the price. I can see how much it costs to produce in terms of the base cost and the percentage of the base cost um, for production. What I like to do is I like to see for my brands, in this case Soft and Solo, I would do it for each one individually. I'd probably create a table maybe in um, Google uh, Sheets or some type of spreadsheet that my teammates and I can access. Um, I would want to have this information there and I'd kind of track it over time. But for my two brands, I want to know who else has a similar price point because the price points here can range all the way from $550 for brand roll down to it looks like $225 for brand soft. So almost twice as much money or literally twice as much money in terms of the retail price for at the high end of the market versus the low end of the market. And so um, a good quick way of kind of seeing who your most closest competitors are is um, based on who's priced in your neighborhood. So I write down, okay, I have my brand soft. All right, who's the closest competitors in terms of price? And then I might think about, okay, what are their characteristics of their product? Um, same thing for my, my other brands. So for each individual brand, I want to know my brand name, I want to know my characteristics, and I want to have my close competitors next to me. Because if you think about the marketing strategy framework, you want to study your competitors, you want to study the consumer, you want to understand your own capabilities. There's not a lot of information on your own capabilities, but you can see what your actual product characteristics are um, to start. So I have a really low price brand. I have a kind of a mid-tier brand with Solo. Um, I can see my features are a seven. Down here it says features can range from five, with like very few features, all the way up to 20. My design um, for my two brands is a four and a six. It says the design can actually range from 3 to 10. So I could do R&D and I could fix, I could improve my design. Let's say Solo is going after a segment that would really prefer a high design, a high end design product. Like, you know, the way it looks, the feel, aesthetics, etc. And I could go ahead and have my engineers create a new version of the product that has a design that's more like an 8, a 9, or a 10 versus what I have currently, which is a 6. I have battery, um, which is the hours that the battery lasts from anywhere from 24 all the way up to 96. The display in inches can range from 4 to 40. 40 seems giant. Um, I guess these are like tablets or laptops. I don't get it. But And then uh, processing power, anywhere from 5 to 100 in terms of gigaflops. Okay. 
So you don't have to think too much about what these are. It's just more that you need to know what you have, you need to know what the competitors have, and you want to think about what the consumers want. And you're going to pick a segment that you think is attractive, so it's big, it's growing, and you think you can win. You have a product that isn't maybe perfect for them, but is better than what the competition is. Or there's not that many competitive brands that are better than you. And then you might need to do some research and design R&D tweaks so that you better fit with what they're looking for. So this is the market report, and it changes every time. Um, you can go ahead, when you're playing the game, it'll have all your, the old periods, so you can go back in time. You can kind of see how it changes. It'll also tell you under variation if there's been a big change. So if someone has a big gain in sales or a big decrease in sales, usually that's because they've launched a new brand. Um, or not a new brand, they've launched a new version of their existing brand. So they've updated their product characteristics to better fit with um, what their consumer segment is looking for. Okay, so I'll go back to the homepage. Okay, so that's that market report. There's other things like industry information that just says like the economy's grown at 3% a year, inflation's 2%. The, that doesn't really matter. I guess you could increase your price by like 2% to keep up with inflation. Or if you keep your price the same, then um, you're kind of becoming cheaper over time relative to overall the economy. Um, there is some information on how much marketing research costs, but uh, I don't pay that much attention to it. There's almost like too much information that if you pay attention to the wrong things, you're not focused on the most critical things. Um, okay. So under uh, market research, some of these studies you don't have right away because you haven't paid a market research agency to um, give you them. Okay. Um, sometimes they're not available because the, uh, the product category doesn't exist yet. So if you go into Vodite, which is the virtual reality headset, you don't get a lot of information on competitive intelligence because there are no competitors currently selling a virtual reality headset, right? Or even like multi-dimensional scaling. You don't get a good positioning map if people don't ha if brands haven't launched, there's no positioning to think about. Um, okay, so what I would say you can start out with for the first round is looking at the consumer survey panel. And you can also get this information if you download it from the Excel. So if you go to resources, you go to Excel report, that'll download all this information into a nice spreadsheet that you could put into like a Google Sheets. So here it is for um, the uh, Excel. So if I go to like the Sonite's market report, it tells me the brand awareness for each brand, um, for the average for the market as a whole, but it also tells me for each segment. So there's five different segments. There's the explorers, um, the shoppers, the professionals, the high earners, and the savers. And each of them are looking for something slightly different. Um, the sh professionals and the high earners are very similar to each other. The shoppers and the savers are kind of similar to each other, and the explorers are kind of like their own unique, very different segment. So in a more kind of big picture way, there's like three segments, or three super segments, the explorers and the shoppers and the savers, which is like the low end, and then the professionals and the high earners, which is the high end. But there's enough differences between each of those, like shoppers and savers and professionals and high earners, that if you're more tailored to any one segment, like if I'm more focused on what the professionals want and I ignore what the high earners want, then I'll go ahead and gain market share with the professionals and someone who's trying to serve both the high earners and the professionals will lose market share to me as I customize everything I do for the professionals. And if a different brand customizes everything they do for the high earners, then a third brand that's trying to serve both segments will be kind of lost in no man's land. Okay. Um, this is just brand awareness though, so I might want to see like, okay, for my brands, right, soft and solo, where do I have high brand awareness? So I could look at these and I could do some conditional formatting, use colors to make it pop. Okay, it looks like soft has highest brand awareness with shoppers and with savers, and solo has highest brand awareness with explorers and um, shoppers. I could clear that conditional formatting. Um, and I can look at within a segment, how are different brands doing? So Solo's doing great with shoppers. That's cool because it's my brand. Um, most and Move are also looking pretty good. And when I go back to that initial 
point where I wrote down my closest competitors based on who's pricing at similar points, I bet you that most to move are also relatively low priced competitors. Now I go down to purchase intentions. Okay, so what? They know about me, but do they like me? Right? Um, it helps, like first you want to get knowledge, but then you want to get evaluation and, and positive intentions. So again, I can look at these shoppers, for instance, I can say, who do, they, who do they like the most? Where do they consider purchasing from? Some more great news. Mom's outside. Yeah, sorry, I got my three-year-old uh, <laughs> um, having fun over there. Teach it from home. Woohoo. So um, you can kind of see where you have high purchase intentions. You might have high awareness but low purchase intentions. That means you probably need to make some changes to your product. Or maybe you should go after a different segment where they like you better even though they don't know about you. Um, and then lastly, I can look at uh, the market share. So again, I can look at buy segment and look at um, where's which brands have good market share for each segment. Okay, so these should roughly add up to, I think about, well, it should add up to 100%. Let's see how precise it is. Um, yeah, so overall they split up for each segment. So this is based on a survey. It's not you know perfect data, it's noisy data. They don't necessarily classify everyone, every survey respondent into the correct segment. But roughly, it gives you a good picture of where you're succeeding, where you're not succeeding. You might have low market share and high purchase intentions. That could be explained possibly because you didn't produce enough units or you weren't in the right distribution channels. You weren't um, having your salespeople go ahead and kind of curry favor and, and build relationships with the big box retailers or the online retailers um, or the, the uh, specialty stores. So you have to have everything aligned in order to really be kicking butt and having success. Um, but this is a, the good first point to kind of see, okay, where are my brands kind of strong? Which segments do I resonate with? It's possible that one of your brands doesn't really resonate very well with any segment. And then you're gonna have to say like, okay, I don't have this natural strong fit with anyone, but I have lots of periods left in this game. So who am I gonna focus on? Where do I think I can do a good job in the long run? So you can look at like, which segments are growing, which segments are underserved. Maybe this segment is not attractive, but it's underserved. So you're like, all right, let's go after that underserved segment. You kind of have to project also what the competition's gonna do because it's a little bit of game theory where a segment could be a good opportunity for you because no one else is going after it. But if a few other brands do the same calculus and they also go after it, now all of a sudden that segment's no longer attractive. So um, it takes kind of this, this that strategic thinking that you're going to have to engage that part of your mind. Um, this tells you where each segment shops, so the shopping habits. And anyways, I downloaded all this into Excel, but the web interface has basically the same information with some kind of good looking charts and stuff. So like if I'm going after the professionals, they um spend relative to other segments a lot of time buying from specialty stores and a relatively large amount of their spending happens online um not so much on the mass merchandise okay not so much on, like target or walmart or whatever so you either need to be like in best buy or you need to be online um and the online channel tends to grow over time so um one thing that you want to be where people are are increasing their shopping behavior and two you want to get out ahead of competition so like if competition's all focused on the big box retailer then maybe you focus on online so um, you want to kind of make sure that you have your sales force talking to the right distribution channels okay so that's that first market research study um, if you know who you're going to target all right that's a very important thing to figure out it makes all your other decisions a lot easier you can also know what other um, competitors are going off that same segment. If you're doing really well and you're priced a little bit higher than your competitors, you can kind of keep your price high. Um, if you're not doing as well as a competitor and you're priced higher than them, maybe you should lower your price a bit. Eventually, you can order these studies like Conjoint and Semantic and Multidimensional that will give you a lot better information in terms of are you overpriced or underpriced or do you need to change 
your brand characteristics, but you start out with just very little information. You got the consumer survey panel, you got the market forecast. Um, you might have semantic, I forget if that's available the first time you open the game, but that's, um, it just, it starts out very meager. Okay, so um, what you wanna do is you want to go eventually make all these decisions. You can't do research and development, you can't do tweaks to your product, which doesn't matter because you won't start out the game with the right information. To make those changes, you really wanna have a conjoint analysis. You also wanna have semantic scales to see like what the target segment wants and then what you have and see if you need to make any adjustments. Um, you don't have perfect information on price yet, so you don't want to make any big changes early on, but once you get better data from Semantic and from Conjoint where you know what each segment wants, what the competition's pricing at, then you can go ahead and try to dial in your price at the level that's going to be uh, most resonate with your target consumer. So early on in the game, you really want to just try to figure out which segment do I want to go after, um, which one's kind of best for each of my brands, who's my competitors, and you don't have good intel on whether your product fits incredibly well other than like your purchase intentions. But anyway, so um, yeah, you can't really make any changes to R&D the first round. You don't really make any changes to your brand portfolio. You're not going to update any brand to be based on a new R&D project because you haven't done any new R&D projects. You're not going to launch any new brands. So you're really focused just on your marketing mix, your commercial team, and your market research studies. The easiest thing to do for market research studies is just go ahead and order everything. So order all studies for the Sonite market, which is these tablets. You're not going to mess around with these virtual reality goggles yet. Um, first you want to just get your existing brands right, get them in a nice stable place, and then you might do um, some more kind of big swings of the bat for a home run. And you can order all studies. Um, if you are not doing very well, if your budget's small, you might want to be more judicious about which uh, market research studies you want to order. Each one isn't very expensive compared to your total budget, but um, if you add them all up, it, it can be a lot if you're really uh, struggling for budget. So some of them are kind of redundant. Like the multidimensional scaling and semantic have a lot of similar information. You can use either one to power your advertising objectives if you want to try to tell an advertising agency to focus on you know, promoting your battery. Uh, as being like top of the line. You can do that with using multidimensional scaling, which is around performance and convenience, or as semantic, you can basically say like, hey, we want our battery to be rated on a one to seven scale as a six, and currently we're rated as a four. And so go ahead and make some cool ads showing that our battery is top of the line. Okay, um, so that's kind of an easy thing to do just to get things started. And then what happens is once you've ordered that, then you can go ahead and explore um, all that you have in terms of information here that might inform your decision making here. So for the practice round, certainly just order everything. Um, okay, for commercial team, you can, if you had competitive intelligence, you could see where your competitors are. If you have industry benchmarking, that also gives you insights there. Distribution panel shows like, oh, you got like basically like very little coverage or all the coverage you need um, in a certain retail distributor. Um, so that's where you go ahead and hire people or sell people. These are like, this logo is a bunch of little ties, right? Very professional people. Um, going ahead and doing sales for you. The marketing mix is kind of the most fun. So for each of your two brands, soft and solo in this case, you go ahead and set your production. You set your price. You decide how much you want to spend on advertising, both in terms of media, getting your message out there and research, making sure that your message quality is high. Um, again, this research usually is five to 10% of your total budget. You decide how you wanna allocate these budgets across consumer segments, right? If I think back for soft, I was having some good traction with savers. Uh, I don't think high earners and professionals cared about me at all. They were going after more of the high-end products, so I would probably drop these to zero. I wanna be more focused, um, even explorers, wasn't really what I was focused on. So I'm going to trim up um, who I'm spending money on. And I really want to spend money on segments that I'm going to resonate with, where I have a chance to be their most preferred brand. So I jumped this all the way up to 86. That's a, um, 
much bigger increase. And so even if I don't increase my total budget on advertising, I've by effectively focusing more on my target segment that resonates with me, I've increased the amount of times they will encounter my advertising message, right? So that's a good way to uh, get more out of your budget if you're struggling. Uh, you can just tighten up your allocations. Eventually, you'll have marketing research that will help you know what type of objectives to set. So you want to tell your advertising agency, like I think I talked about it before, I, I could say for the semantic research report, I know that my segment wants a battery of a six out of seven. So I'm going to go ahead and say, like, let's go ahead and tell them that on this one to seven scale that I'm a six because that's what they're looking for in a battery. Now, the one to seven scale is like one is no bad is like batteries pathetic, seven is batteries insane. And so it's like this kind of perceptual, fuzzy, subjective measure. And eventually you might need to translate that to actual engineers who want to say, just tell me not like a one to seven scale, tell me like how many hours of battery you need in this laptop. And so that translation process, um, I'll cover in the next video. You can also read about it in the participant handbook under uh, research, research and design, R&D. Um, it'll kind of walk you through how to kind of look at the research reports for the right information and how to translate these kind of consumer subjective evaluations into hard engineer, like give me some numbers and I'll create you the product you want. So anyways, this is where you set those objectives. If you just want to focus on raising your brand awareness, you don't need to message anything specific. You just want to get your name out there. You want to have a simple message that people understand. So this is where you set that. Uh, you want to spend your entire budget. So there's no use in holding back. You don't get to spend it next time. Um, how you get a bigger budget is you have success. So there's almost always some good use of your money. Again, the economy is not in a big recession. Go ahead and ball out and let that money flow. Um, so go ahead and, and raise your, your spending. In this case, I'm going to jump this up to, let's say, 2200 uh, If I had that marketing um, research experiment, it might tell me where there's good return on investment for increasing spending. I don't have that in my first round, so I'll have that next time um, when I increase my so anyways, as I change these numbers, all right, these are in K, K for 1,000, it changes how much remaining budget I have left. I can go ahead and set that for solo as well. Maybe I need to produce more units or less units. This tells me like how many units I sold, how many did I produce, if I have any extra inventory. It costs money to have extra inventory, so you want to sell out. Um, but you don't want to be so conservative in your plan to produce that um, you are, could have sold a lot more, but you didn't sell them. So there's a cost for holding inventory. It's like my parents used to have two refrigerators and freezers, and they'd go to Costco, and they'd buy all this stuff from Costco, and they'd be like, oh, I saved so much money. I'd be like, yeah, but you know you're running electricity for this whole other refrigerator freezer. Like, that costs money. Like, <laughs> And you have to have um, storage space at your house for all that. So now they're laughing because... They don't want to go shopping with the coronavirus. But um, anyways, there's a cost to holding an inventory. So you want to be conscious of that. Um, where you find out what you should expect to produce and what you should expect to sell is this market forecast. So for each segment, they tell you from the current period how many thousands of units were actually purchased. And they tell you for next period how many thousands of units you should expect to be purchased. And so if I'm going after the savers, and last period they bought 204,000 laptops, and next period they're going to buy 240,000 laptops, and I think I can get, um, let's say, 50% of that, right? Well, there's an increase of about 40,000 units, and if I'm going to get 50% of it, then I should expect to sell another 20,000 units. Um, what helps a lot with all that, like doing the math of multiplying both your market share times the market forecast is this marketing plan. And you have to go ahead and enter almost all your decisions in order for it to work. But once it's set up to go, it can go ahead and say, like, what's the segment size? What do you estimate each segment will be in terms of how big it will be? And you can copy that market forecast data. So it will update and show you the growth of each segment. 
And so the segment I'm going after is going to increase by 18.5%. Okay. And then I can go ahead and copy um, my market share estimates that I got from my consumer survey panel research study, which is this one right here. And it will just pull that information right in there for you. And let's say I know I'm coming out with a new and improved product. So last time I got 46%. I think I'm going to increase my market share of the savers because I did a good job adapting to what they want. But I also think I'm going to get less of the high earners because I'm not really focused on them and some other competitive brand is. Professionals, I also am pessimistic about. Shoppers, I'll be conservative. I'll know that to 10% and explorers, I'll put that on the zero. So you as the manager have information and expectations around how your market share is going to change based on your decisions. So you can and kind of influence these estimates here by using your managerial judgment. Um, you go ahead and click next and it tells you how many thousands of units or just how many units um, you expect to sell to each segment. And so I'll sell maybe 15,000 to shoppers and 120,000 to savers. That would be 136,000 total for soft. I click next and it knows um, now kind of how much uh, revenue I should expect to get. So for my soft brand, I um, am estimated to be able to sell 136,000 units. That's what we just did right there. But my production plan is only to plan to produce 100,000 units. Because I only plan to sell 100,000 units, but I could sell 136,000 units, I can ramp up my production. So I can halfway through the year come back, wow, this thing's selling great. Let's ramp it up. But I only have so many employees. I only have so many suppliers, I only have so many parts, so my uh, production team can ramp up 20% higher than whatever I intended to. They also could ramp down 20% below what I intended to produce if we get information that things aren't going good, so that's kind of like your wiggle room, plus or minus 20%. So anyways, in this case, I didn't produce enough, so I have this kind of final sales of 120,000 units. Um, this is just your estimate. This is just your plan. So now I can go back and I can tweak it. So I'll change it to be 136,000 units. It knows my price. So it knows my, my total sales. I would sell 16,800. This is a K. So cha-ching. That means this is 16 million, 16.8 million. It knows my cost of goods sold, right? Because, um, you know, each unit I produce costs the money to produce it, right? And so it takes that out. I don't spend any money on inventory holding. That's my contribution before marketing. I take out my marketing expenditures, which in this case is advertising media, advertising research, and my sales force, which is my commercial team costs. And then that's my basically profit, which is my contribution after marketing. Both brands contribute their each individual um, profit, and then that aggregates up to my overall company profit which is reported here for each unit. So if I see an in increase in my revenue, if I see an increase in my profits, I should also expect to see an increase in my share price. And that's ultimately what you're trying to do. Okay, so that's just a quick overview, a lot of information. Um, I don't expect you to get it right away, but whichever teams do get it sooner, obviously will be able to outperform the other teams. So there is a competitive nature to this game. And so if you are a competitor um, and you don't have a lot of other demands of your time, you should be in good shape. Um, and if you're not, at least you get some uh, exposure to taking market research studies in and making brand management decisions. Um, I hope you like it. If you struggle, please uh, message me and the two teaching assistants through Canvas, so Bryson and Jessica. And we'll try to provide you some coaching and feedback and um, just kind of help you. But the struggle is the learning opportunity. So I expect some of you to struggle. I expect some of you to um, experience this as a bit overwhelming, and that's okay. That's the learning opportunity. Okay, there will be another video later, especially on how to take some of these marketing research reports and use them to do research and development decisions that can tweak your product to better fit with your target customer segment. But you are gonna to have to do the hard work to figure out. <laughs> Yay, my three-year-old went to the bathroom. <laughs> She's being potty trained. All right, signing off, good night, take care. Um, go ahead, and uh, I hope you enjoy. For the practice rounds, just have fun, but 
I wouldn't like work too hard on it. It'd be kind of a waste of time more just familiarize yourself with everything. But then for the, um, once we start going after two practice rounds, then, you know, kick in your competitive spirits and, and try to kick butt. Okay. Uh, see you.